text this morning is from John chapter 16, beginning at verse 16 and going through the end, or actually through verse 24. I'm going to read it to you. If you have it in front of you, great, follow along. If not, um, listen. Jesus said, a little while, and you will see me no longer, and again a little while, and you will see me. So some of the disciples said to one another, what is this that he says to us, a little while, and you will not see me, and again a little while, and you will see me, and because I'm going to the Father. So they were saying, what does he mean by a little while? We do not know what he's talking about. Well, Jesus knew what they wanted to ask him, so he said to them, is this what you're asking yourselves, what I meant by saying a little while and you will not see me, and again a little while and you will see me? Truly, truly, I say to you, you will weep and lament, but the world will rejoice. You will be sorrowful, but your sorrow will turn into joy. When a woman is giving birth, she has sorrow because her hour has come. But when she has delivered the baby, she no longer remembers the anguish for joy that a human being has been born into the world. So also you have sorrow now... But I will see you again, and your hearts will rejoice, and no one will take your joy from you. In that day you will ask nothing of me. Truly, truly, I say to you, whatever you ask of the Father in my name, he will give it to you. Until now you have asked nothing in my name. Ask, and you will receive, that your joy may be full. All right, there's the text. Very intriguing. I guess I could say, do you get it? Get what he said? <laughs> I remember one of the first sermons I ever preached as I was preparing to begin pastoral ministry. I was a student, and I was filling in for a pastor of a small church in northeastern Indiana the Sunday before Christmas, 1973. I picked my text from Matthew's genealogy leading, to the, uh, leading up to the birth of Jesus, and I was talking about the curse of Jeconiah and how Jesus, by being virgin-born, avoided the curse while retaining the rightful claim to the throne of David. And I called it something like how the devil almost stole Christmas. And at the time, I thought it was a really clever sermon. Um, and as I was preaching, the people looked at me like I was speaking in a foreign language. I thought it was clear. I I'd studied the text. I, in fact, uh, I... I um, I even stopped a couple of times in the middle of the message and said, are you with me? And they smiled. A um, couple of times I uh, wondered what was going on. My wife at the time, Karen and I weren't married yet. She, she and I were dating, and, um, and I, I don't think we, we might have been, yeah, we were engaged by then. And so she was sitting there, and she's looking and listening, and I don't think she got it either. Interestingly enough, six months or so later, that church hired me, and we spent 10 years of our lives with those dear people, but I'm pretty sure they don't remember that I was the same guy who preached that first sermon. <laughs> well, the point is this, that sometimes we just don't get it. A teacher or a preacher may make multiple efforts to help us, and we may say, oh, now I see, I get it now, when in reality, we really don't. We just want them to move on, you know, so we just sort of say that. And that was actually the situation that was occurring in John 16. If you were to skip down to verse 29, you will see that very thing happening. Jesus is speaking. He says, in a little while, and you will see me no longer. And again, a little while, and you will see me. And, and they're, and they're um, looking at him and asking on the inside, what are you talking about? And add to this the bewilderment of all of the evening that's already transpired. I mean, think about that. Jesus invites them into this upper room, and one of the first things he does is he begins to wash their feet. And they're going, what is this about? And then, then Judas gets up, and there's this little conversation between Jesus and Judas. He leaves, and then Jesus starts teaching about bearing fruit and, and going to the Father and talk about the world hating them and the disciples running away, and one of them's going to betray him, and Peter's going to deny him, and on and on. It's no wonder they say, what does he mean? We don't know what he's talking about. So confusing, so overwhelming. Believe it or not, their confusion and their fear and their sorrow, Jesus says, is all going to be transformed into joy. And Jesus explains how that's going to happen in these few verses. And we're going to look at that in a minute. First, kids, you have your activity sheets. We have some things to talk about. In this passage, there, 
There are sorrow and confusion and fear. There are also incredible promises, and there's overflowing joy. This is what I want you to be listening for. So here it is. When Jesus was saying, in a little while, and you will see me no longer, what event in his life was he talking about? And when he said, and then in a little while you will see me, what event in his life was he talking about then? Jesus said that their sorrow would be transformed into joy. What illustration did Jesus use to describe that transformation? Jesus offered some amazing promises about prayer. We are instructed to pray to the Father in whose name? And finally, what did Jesus promise would belong to us if we belong to him. Three-letter word. What is that? Okay, there you go. So have fun with that. I'll see you at the end. By the way, my wife is not here today. She's, tr she's uh, on her way to Tennessee. So she will not be back there guarding the basket. So wait till I get there before you dive in. All right? All right. All right. Well, let's talk first of all about this mystery of this little, uh, these little wild statements what was Jesus talking about? We need to look at that, the explanation of these statements. Uh, this is somewhat of a veiled accounting of Jesus' trials and his death and his burial and their deep sorrow. And it's true that the disciples would be brought into a rich and deep intimacy with Jesus as he explained, at, at, as he explained in the vine and the branches in chapter 15. But first, something would happen. Before they really understood that or knew that, First would come the cross. The disciples would be brought into greater understanding and even further revelation about the Lord Jesus and his plan and purpose with the coming of the Comforter. But first, there would come the cross. It's true that they would find peace in the midst of the hatred of the world, but first would come the cross. So Jesus reminded them, in a little while, you will see me no longer. Some think this little while period was between Jesus' death and his promised return in power and great glory as a great king of kings, which, by the way, hasn't happened. But I don't think that fits the context here. Rather, I think what's going on is something else. So in a little while, the first little while, I think he's dealing with the idea of his death. Jesus told his disciples that during this little while, the world would rejoice. And the disciples would be sorrowful. But then their sorrow would be turned into joy. The sorrow of weeping of the disciples can only fit during the time between the death and resurrection of Jesus. When we follow the gospel accounts, the sorrow and utter despair are clearly present after Jesus' death, right? I mean, Jesus is taken, he's crucified, he's taken down from the cross, he's laid in a tomb. What was the state of the disciples? They were despondent. They actually go, essentially, lock themselves into a room and really are absolutely afraid, plus overwhelmed by fear, by despondency. However, John will make the point later on in chapter 20, verse 20, he will say this, when he had said this, this is when he appears after he's raised from the dead, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. A little while you will not see me, he says. That's his death. And again a little while, and you will see me. Resurrection. That, I think, fits. Now, it could be argued that Jesus was being intentionally vague, but he was doing this for a purpose. And, and, and he said just enough so that after the cross, when all of this played out exactly as he said, they would know that what he knew and what he was talking about, and that would result in giving him glory. It would also move them to take a closer look at what he had said as the Holy Spirit brought back that memory. And I think that's probably it. It's like when somebody says something and you're kind of in a fog and you don't really understand it, and then it becomes clear, all of a sudden you think, you know what, I better check out the other things that were said here. And I think that's probably what was taking place. And in fact, later on, when the disciples, as the Spirit of God began to bring those things into their mind and they recorded the New Testament, we have that for ourselves. 
So the first part of this statement, a little while and you will see me no longer, is a thinly veiled account of Jesus' death. Now the second part of the statement, and again, a little while you will see me, that's the veiled accounting of Jesus' resurrection and their great joy. To this point, the disciples are still in confusion. The threat of Jesus' departure had not yet become a reality, but it appears imminent. And when it does occur, Jesus predicted great sorrow on their part. And he said that they would weep and lament. They would be devastated. They would be overwhelmed by grief. But something would happen that would immediately change all of that. In fact, they would go from horrible grief and fear and despondency to absolute joy, what was going to happen that would make that happen so fast? Your sorrow, he says, will be turned into joy. Jesus does not directly answer the question that they ask, but he does address their need. He does not say that they will have no sorrow. He does not promise to alleviate all of their grief. He does promise them that what they immediately feel will be changed and it will be turned into something quite good and unexpected. When the resurrection takes place, the disciples' despair would turn into a deep and abiding joy, and that joy would eclipse the despair that preceded it. Truly, truly, I say to you, says Jesus, you will weep and lament, but the world will rejoice. You will be sorrowful, but your joy, or I'm sorry, your sorrow will be turned into joy. And then Jesus gives an illustration to explain the transformation. So let's look at the illustration. Really two ideas are in this section. One would be the idea or the illustration of childbirth. Okay, so he's going to talk about the pain of childbirth that's transformed into joy. Now in the past, I've attempted to make this point long time ago, but I remember it. I was challenged by moms who said to me after their children were born, they did not forget the pain, and I didn't know what I was talking about, okay? So let me back up and try to explain this the way I think what Jesus is saying, or at least I'm going to let the text do the talking, all right? Now listen to what Jesus says. When a woman is giving birth, she has sorrow because her hour has come. But when she has delivered the baby, she no longer remembers the anguish for joy that a human being has been born into the world. Now, without getting myself into too much trouble, here's the point, I think. Now was the time for grief, but Jesus would see them again, and they would rejoice, and no one would be able to take that joy away from them. Like a woman birthing a child, the very thing that generated the grief also generates the joy. So basically, this is an illustration about transformation. Okay? For the disciples, the cross that would grieve them now would prove to be their joy. It's not just a movement from grief to joy, but it's grief transformed into joy. That's the point, I think. Uh, so, moms, do I get a pass? Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, there's more to what Jesus says as we make the application of the disciples in verse 22. So also, he says, you have sorrow now, but I will see you again, and your hearts will rejoice, and no one will take your joy from you. So, what was the painful sorrow that was going to be turned to joy here? And this is the second part of this illustration, I think. It's the pain of separation that they were feeling that was going to be now turned into joy. The drudgeries of life, the disciplines of life, the trials of life, though often extraordinarily painful, when we look back, are often the very things that generated great spiritual growth and even lasting joy in our lives. In fact, the cross that was to cause such suffering to them as they watch Jesus die would be the very thing in which they would glory in the weeks and months and years ahead. The sorrow proved to be their salvation and their hope and their eternity. The first part of verse 23 says that in, in the day of his resurrection they will ask nothing of Jesus. It's kind of interesting that word for ask, it means to, uh, that verb 
uh, used means to ask a question rather than to ask for something. In other words, the resurrection would answer the questions they had now about what was going on, and they would have no more need to ask any more questions. The bewilderment would be transformed into a confident assurance and hope wrapped up in pure joy. But there would later be some asking in the form of requesting some things, and we'll check that out. So that's what happens in this first part as he's talking about this idea of... Um, the suffering, the pain, the difficulty turning into joy. Now let's talk about how this now goes from that discussion to joy in relationship to intercession or to prayer. Truly, truly, I say to you, whatever you ask of the Father in my name, he will give it to you. Until now, you've asked nothing in my name. Ask, and you will receive that your joy may be full. So what is Jesus teaching here? Two things, basically. One, he's teaching that intercession, prayer, is through Jesus. Intercession, prayer, is to the Father. That's what he's saying here, I think. So let's start with intercession through the Son. Verse 23 makes a new point. This is accented by the formula, truly, truly, I say to you. When Jesus used those words, if you have King James Bible, it's verily, verily or truly, truly, or amen, amen. It means, pay attention, this is good stuff, here it is, listen carefully, this is the truth. Not that anything that Jesus said was not the truth, but he's pointing out, listen to this, truly, truly, I say to you, and he makes known the fact that after the resurrection, something new would happen in relation to the disciples' prayers. Up until now, the disciples had not yet asked the Father for anything in Jesus' name. Oh, they prayed, but not in Jesus' name. Now, this verb for ask, unlike the earlier verb, is to ask for something. Access to the Father through the Son and his role as mediator is inseparably connected to the cross. Remember that it was because of Jesus' death that we are given access to the Father. If Jesus had not died, would we have access to the Father, yes or no? No. In order for us really to talk to the Father, to have access to him, there had to be something done with our sin because our sin separates us from God. So Jesus, when he dies, he covers us with his righteousness, forgives our sin, opens the door of access to the Father. And so this whole discussion about you've not asked anything from the Father in my name, I mean, you can understand why he's saying that. Access to the Father is through the Son, and his role as mediator is connected to the cross. Remember that it is because of Jesus' death that we're given access to the Father. In other words, for the Father to answer and for the disciples to receive joy, Jesus had to die future of their effectiveness in prayer depended on Jesus, and that would start with his work on the cross. In my name has been mentioned before in chapter 14, whatever you ask in my name, this I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. That's a stupendous prayer, isn't it? A stupendous promise. Chapter 15, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. And my name includes all that he is and all that he's done. Prior to the cross, this would not have been possible to pray in his name. After his death and resurrection, it would be possible, and it would be appropriate, and it would happen regularly in the lives of Jesus' disciples, not only then, but also now. Intercession would be made through the Son as it was made to the Father. Intercession to the Father in the name of the Son, would yield the result, whatever you ask, he will give it to you. Now again, that's an incredible statement. Granted, it's conditioned by, in my name, referring obviously to Jesus, it's not a formula, it's not some little theological rabbit's foot, you know, where in your name, you know, and it's not that, okay. It's all that he is, surely the Father's unbounded love and amazing grace and the promise of answered prayer adds to our joy. Now think about it for a minute. When you pray in Jesus' name according to his will and purpose, he has said he will answer. 
Is that not incredible? We're talking about God here. God who created all things, God who is above all things, we're able to have access to God, talk to him, he will answer according to his will. That's stupendous. You're not convinced, or are you? I mean, it's, it's amazing that that's true. He will hear and he will answer according to his will as it's expressed in Jesus' name. We have access. Further reinforced, ask and you'll receive that your joy may be full. James Boyce, who's now with the Lord Jesus, who used to be pastor in Philadelphia, he said this, ask and you'll receive that your joy may be full. Modern prayer, much modern prayer, even by serious Christian people, is useless and ineffective because the people involved approach God thinking he is obliged to grant their request because of something they have themselves done for him. Now, we all have that problem. Lord, I've really tried hard this week. I've really tried to please you this week. I've tried not to sin. I've tried to do all these things. Now, please answer my request. When we pray and we're looking for God's answers, it's not payback, okay? That's, that's not the way it works. It is not true that God is obliged because of what we have done. What is true is that he answers, why? Because of what he has done. See, when we come on the merit of Jesus, and that's the only way we can approach the Father... When we come on the merit of Jesus in his name, we receive from the Father not only the answers to our requests, but also we receive the fullness of joy. Again, we need to understand that our status before God rests exclusively upon the cross work of Christ. Because of that sacrifice, we have free access to the Father. Don Carson said this, the Father loves us. That's a wonderful truth we must learn. He loved us enough to send his son. And now with the son's cross work a fact of history and our offense to deity's holiness removed by the Lamb of God, the Father loves us because we've loved Jesus. Therefore, the joy gained by living this side of Calvary is unmistakably bound up with the sheer delight of a personal knowledge of the Father's love. Get a hold of this. God loves me. That's that's. That doesn't make sense, but it's true. God loves me. God loves you if you know, if you know Jesus Christ. Is that, does that do nothing for you? Isn't that amazing? I mean, think about the Apostle John. After he hears all this, he writes a letter, and in his letter he writes this. See what kind of love the Father has given to us that we should be called the children of God? He's jumping up and down. He's having a hard time writing. He's jumping up and down. So are we. The reason why the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared, but we know that when he appears, we shall be like him because we shall see him as he is. I can't see God because I do not have a glorified body, but one of these days he will change all that. I'll stand in his presence and I will see God in all of his glory. And the first thing I will respond to, I think, is this. God loves me. I'm blown away by that. That's what John is saying here. Isn't it? Now, when we pray, recognizing the love of God for us because of what Jesus has done, is that not filling your tank with joy? <laughs> joy is the result of the relationship we have with the Father through the Son. If that's not the case, then there are a couple of problems here. If there's no joy in your life, then one, you need to have, or you have a spiritual ailment, okay? You need to go for a checkup. There's something wrong there if there's no joy in your heart, if you know, if you know Jesus. Now, sometimes we get in those places where we get discouraged and frustrated, and, and joy is the last thing that we're thinking about. 
It just doesn't seem to be there. I think Warren Wiersbe wrote a, a little commentary on, on the book of Philippians, and he talked about the things that can rob us of our joy. It doesn't really take it away, but it sure does cover it up. And those things he mentioned were circumstances, people, things, and worry. Any of those resonate with you? But when we begin to concentrate on the love that God has for us in Christ Jesus, now that we belong to him, have access to the Father, the joy begins to flow. And if we have problems with that, then we need, some, we need to go back and look at who he is and what he's done. Or you don't belong to Jesus. Because if you don't belong to Jesus, you don't have joy. You might be happy in some things in the world, but you don't have lasting joy. What was the joy that Jesus promised? That your joy may be full, and the implication is it won't ever be taken away. That's amazing. There you have it. Terrible sorrow turned to abundant joy. That, my friends, is transformational. Such a difference happens in the time between. In a little while, and you will see me, no longer. And in a little while, you will see me. Disciples despondent, overwhelmed, crushed. Jesus rises from the dead. They're empowered. They're filled with joy. And they keep on preaching until they die. And then they find out joy unspeakable and full of glory when they stand in his presence. The very thing that brought them crushing sorrow a few days later brought them an inexpressible joy. The cross that took Jesus from them was the same cross that brought Jesus to them. The awfulness of the sacrifice gave way to the joy of his great love. So it is with us. The sorrows, the troubles, the burdens of life... They are all transformed by the cross for those who are in Christ Jesus. That was the promise to the disciples. I believe that is also a valid promise for us. There you have it. Transformed by joy. That's who you are in Christ Jesus. If, in fact, you are in Christ Jesus. Let's pray. Father, thank you for um, an amazing passage to remind us that whatever's going on in our life, and there's a ton of stuff going on in our lives, overwhelming stuff, frustrating stuff, hurtful things, sorrowful things, pressures. But in Christ, you promised us a joy, a joy that transforms, or that's the result at least. All those things transformed into, into joy because of Jesus. Dear God, I pray that you will remind us of that and help us to walk in that joy, to be filled with the joy of Jesus. I pray that would be the case. Please grant that. If we're struggling, help us to surrender to you that we might see that joy overflow. If some are here who do not know you, Father, I pray that you would press on their hearts by your spirit the need to trust in Jesus as Savior, to embrace him by faith, to recognize that he paid the price for our sin, that he died on Calvary's cross in order that we might have our sins forgiven and in order that we might have life in his name. Make that clear, that they too might know the joy of Christ. Thank you for allowing us to be together. Thank you for the blessings of the day. Thank you for the songs we could sing and for the report we can receive from Paul, and thank you for the opportunity we can have to, to encounter, intersect with your precious word by your spirit. Teach us. Don't let us alone. Help us to grasp the amazing hope that we have in Jesus by your spirit. We love you. Thank you for loving us in Christ's name.